yesterday, uh, I had this uh, terrifying experience of having to, um, to sort of save the world in 15 minutes. It, it, it's what I felt, it was sort of Klaus Schwab on steroids yesterday in the, the opening session when we were asked to describe a better tomorrow in 15 minutes. And I think it's somewhat pretentious, even for distinguished groups such as you have up here, to, to try and do that. Today, we have seven minutes to save, to save the marketing world. Uh, so it's an extremely difficult task. Let me just try and, try and sort of drill down a bit because we've been talking about sort of much more philosophical, general things. And I, I really want to try, as I'm the last, the last speaker, to, to deal with it a little bit more practically, I think, as to what, you know, what will make marketeers win in the future? And I want to look at it through a lens, the lens of WPP, because there are three lenses that we think are absolutely critical. And I, I have to be careful because I'm standing in front of our second largest client, not, not by s physical size, uh, but by revenue size, Procter & Gamble. So we're, we're very honored that Sophie uh, is chairing this, this session. But the three lenses are, are really important. The first is this shift in the power balance in the world. And it's not a shift just to the east. It's a shift to the south. We touched on that in the opening session as we had a Colombian uh, representative, Shakira, from that southern continent that is growing in importance and is so important. This is the decade of Latin America, in our view, and the, the view of Luis Moreno at the IEDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, who we work closely. That's, so it's a shift to the south, a, sif, a shift to the east, and a shift to the southeast. Uh, I'm, I'm taking New York as the center of the world, as the current center of the world in making those geographical comments, and the southeast means Africa and the Middle East. So that's number one. Number two is the marketeer that wins, I think, will understand that the world is still plagued with overcapacity. That in every major category that we operate in, almost without exception, there are one or two exceptions, there is significant overcapacity. Our largest client, Ford Motor Company, operates in cars and trucks. You would think post Lehman and post the Chapter 11 collapse of two major manufacturers, not Ford, they didn't take government money, but of GM and Chrysler, you would think capacity had been reduced on a worldwide basis, but think again, it hasn't. There is still a capacity to produce 80 million cars and trucks. Consumers can only consume 60 million, which means what we do, the differentiation business, is critically important. Where the shortage is, despite the fact that we're sitting in the Middle East, which is blessed with younger populations, you look at Pakistan with 185 million people, very strong youth profile. Ultimately, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, even countries with young profiles such as Mexico will peak and their age profiles will become older because of me medical revolutions and changes and improvements, but also because generally birth rates are declining. So. The shortage will be not in productive capacity, but in human capital. And the single most important differentiating factor between companies will be how they find, incentivize, motivate, keep, retain, train, evaluate people. That's where we think there's a war for talent now, stand by, it's gonna get worse. The third area is the web. It's already been touched on by Maurice, by Dan, by Stan, by everybody. But the web, in principle, does three things. It disintermediates legacy businesses. It disintermediates them with a lower cost business model. And last, looping back to the, to the talent point, it steals your talent. Young people like to work in smaller, more responsive, less bureaucratic companies. And the age of apprenticeship inside large corporations has largely disappeared, some would argue quite rightly. 
but it, it has a significant impact, not just in the economics and business models, but in the approach to talent. The fourth area where marketeers will win is understanding the growing power of retail. And it's power in two senses. It's true that Walmart is the seventh largest country in the world by retail sales, just behind China. It has, I think, sales of about $475 billion the last time I checked. It is true that Tesco is more than 50% of its floor space is now outside the United Kingdom. And it's true that Carrefour extends its influence uh, and significance around the world, although it's been more challenged maybe than the first two. But it's not just about the power that retail has in terms of procurement and buying on a worldwide basis. It's about the power that retail has in terms of its connection to the consumer. Post Lehman, the clients, our clients that responded most to the challenge of price and value in the West were not the manufacturers, it was the retailers. And the reason is quite simple. They interact with consumers on a day-to-day -day basis. Manufacturers do not. Manufacturers tend to think of their client base being the trade, not being consumers. It is not an accident that Tesco owns a company called Dunhambi, which has probably the richest source of data on consumers, certainly in the United States through its joint venture with Kroger and in other countries such as the UK in that Tesco relationship. The fifth area is inter internal communications. Marketeers will win, companies will win, who communicate strategic and structural change using the new technologies internally. We at WPP have a multi-branded company, Ogilvy, JWT, Gray, Young and Rubicum, and others that we've built over 25 years primarily by acquisition. Managing a multi-branded company that's grown by acquisition is the most difficult model. The easiest model, I think, is a unibranded model, a unibranded company like a McKinsey or a Goldman Sachs in the professional services area that has not grown by acquisition, that has grown organically. But manage, managing the internal constituencies through communication is critically important. The seventh area that we think is important is finance and procurement. In the sense that finance and procurement probably has too much power in organizations post Lehman. Don't forget that on September the 13th, 14th, 2008, the financial world almost came to an end. If you haven't read Andrew Ross Sorkin's book, Too Big to Fail, you really should. You'll see there that Jeff Immelt, for example, said that GE was in danger of almost being unable to finance its liabilities within 48 hours. Warren Buffett called it America's financial Pearl Harbor. This has had a searing effect not just on consumers in the West, not consumers in the East. We see their attitude to luxury consumption relatively un unchanged, but it's had a big effect on corporates. It is no accident that Western-based multinationals have two to three million dollars, trillion dollars, on their balance sheets, on relatively unleveraged balance sheets, and it's no accident they're investing more in the brand and in maintaining or increasing market share rather than increasing capacity. There's an incredibly conservative attitude, particularly in Western-based companies that face relatively slow growth in GMP. So finance and procurement has too much power. Marketing has been weakened, particularly in the last two years. That has to change. The, the, the simple fact is there's a finite limit to what you can do in reducing cost, whereas at least until you get to 100% market share, there is no limit to what you can do in expanding the top line. The eighth area that we see significant importance for, for marketeers is government. Government has invested something, if that's the right word, something like $12 trillion in the last two years post Lehman in TARPs, in investment initiatives, in investments in sectors like financial services and autos do not think that government will retreat. If you look at the historical precedent in 1929, government stayed as a major regulator, interloper, investor until the Second World War. It did not go away quickly. 
In fact, the uncertainty that we're seeing in the financial markets at the moment is because there is this uncertainty as what, what the American government will do in terms of withdrawing their financial facilities. So government is here to stay. Think of them as a client as well as a regulator or investor. The ninth area is healthcare. It's been touched on by Dan, I think, quite, quite eloquently. Every single company we see, almost without exception again, is very focused on health and well-being and improving the quality of life. And the last point I want to loop back on is corporate social responsibility. Marketers will succeed if they understand that doing good is good business. It's no longer about charity or altruism or greenwashing. If I was standing here five to 10 years ago, many chairmen and CEOs would pay lip service to CSR issues. Now it's embedded and it's in part of every enterprise, and this is the critical factor, that has long-term interest in building their businesses, their products, their services, their corporate brands. So CSR and it has become embedded. It's not charity, it's not altruism, it's doing good is good business. And I just want to come back to those three lenses because I started on the BRICS and Next 11 and the shift in power. The second lens is the growth and power of digital and new media. And the last point is the importance of consumer insight. When I talk about consumer insight, I'm talking about two things. One is data analytics. I hesitate to disagree with an academic and a practical academic like Dan, but I do think the marginal cost of information is zero. And what people have is information at their fingertips, and analysis of data is critically important. And related to that, it's the application of technology. We at WPP will not build giant server farms like Google. We will not hire scads of PhDs, although we do employ more and more PhDs not only in Israel, but elsewhere. What we are about is the application of technology to our business. And I just want to make one final point. Marketeers will understand, successful marketeers will understand that the new technology companies, and I include Google, Facebook, Twitter as examples, are really media owners masquerading as technology companies. These companies are aligned to media channels. They are the new media owners. We at WPP manage a media book, if I can call it that, of $70 billion around the world. We buy $70 billion of media around the world. We regard our objective as deciding whether, with our clients, whether that's the right amount, whether it should be more or less, and which channels of allocation are made, how we allocate the money. That's why we call it media investment management. It's essential to understand that. If you fail to understand, it's sort of like if Rupert Murdoch or Sumner Redstone went directly to our clients and said, you should invest your money in Rupert's case, in the Wall Street Journal, in Fox, in the Times in London, whatever it is. Media agnosticism is, and independence is absolutely critical. Those are the factors we think are the important ones. Thank you, Sophie. Thank Did you I very much. Start?